Okay, um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about neural networks for decoding natural images from retinal neurons. Uh, many people contributed to this work, especially Nikhil and Will, who are both here at this conference. Um, Nikhil is a co-first author, so you can always ask them questions. So a major field of research in neuroscience concerns neural coding and the relationship between sensory stimulus and the corresponding sensory neurons. So we can think about this relationship in two ways. One is encoding, which is the process of giving the sensory input, what are the neural responses, trying to predict those. Um, and the opposite that I'll focus on is decoding, and that's the process of trying to reconstruct the sensory input given the spiking responses. So um, we care about decoding for a couple reasons. So decoding helps us to understand what the informational content of spikes is, and then we can examine what parts of the stimulus different cell types are encoding. And I'll be talking about decoding in the retina, and here we especially care about good decoding models because they can help to assess retinal prosthetics because we can get a sense of the maximal visual restoration possible from the different patterns of activity elicited by the retinal prosthetic. So there are a couple different um, methods of performing decoding. The most common is linear decoding. This is a simple linear regression from spikes to stimulus. So for example, in the visual domain, we would reconstruct a pixel as a weighted sum of neural responses. So this is a very simple model, but um, has been pretty successful at basic stimuli, such as one-dimensional stimuli. A more complicated model is Bayesian inference. So here you would try to incorporate important information about the statistics of the stimulus or the stimulus prior. This is difficult in vision, though, because deriving a natural image this prior is really, really difficult, both theoretically and computationally, despite decades of people working on this. So we propose to use deep neural networks to help enhance the decoding. Um, these have been obviously successful at a lot of different tasks, especially in the image realm, and very good at denoising and super resolution, which are both relevant to decoding. We also would hope that the deep neural network could learn implicitly statistics of the stimulus. So basically, we would hope that we could use a neural network to approximate the full Bayesian decoder without having this explicit prior. So specifically, we propose to use deep neural networks on top of linear decoders. So this shows the general pipeline of what we plan to do. So we are working with retinal ganglion cell responses. So these are the primary cells in the retina that send information on. And then given some retinal ganglion cell responses to an image, we use a linear decoder to get a basic reconstruction. And then we want to use a deep neural network to enhance that reconstruction to more closely resemble the original image. And the reason we use this two-staged approach instead of going straight from spikes to decoded images with a neural network is that then we're entirely in image space, so we can use all the image-to-image -image neural network architectures that have been developed. So in this talk, I'll primarily focus on simulated responses instead of real responses. Um, but... And that's because we didn't have data of the exact type we wanted, and we wanted to explore um, different uh, aspects of this approach using simulations more easily. But in general, a problem with deep neural networks is that there is limited training data because there's limited experimental data, both in the retinal preparation we use and in neuroscience experiments generally. So we propose to use an encoding model to go from image to neural responses. And using this, we can generate unlimited amounts of training data. So then we can train the linear decoder and the neural network on this unlimited training data and then transfer back to the real data. So we circumvent the problem of limited experimental data. And so basically, we are trying to learn the corresponding Bayesian decoder for a specific encoding model through amortized inference. Basically, we're putting a lot of effort into the training of these models. And then at test time, they should run very quickly. So while I'm only going to be talking about simulated responses, we do tie our simulations closely to previously collected real data. So basically this retina prep consists of showing a natural images movie to a small piece of monkey retina that lies on an electrode array. So you record from many cells simultaneously. So we fit linear and nonlinear Poisson models to these cell responses. These are pretty standard models in neuroscience. And they basically consist of filtering of the stimulus, followed by a nonlinearity, followed by Poisson spike draws. And the point of this slide is just to show that our encoding models seem reasonable. 
So we deal with four different retinal ganglion cells, on and off paracel cells, and on and off midget cells. And here I'm showing an example cell of each type, and the black line is the recorded firing rate, and the red line is the predicted firing rate from our models, and you can see that they track pretty closely. So we're using reasonable encoding models. But for, we wanted to start with decoding static images instead of movies, because that's a lot less complicated problem. So we designed an experimental stimulus consisting of pulse movies. So each pulse movie consists of gray frames followed by one natural image repeated for multiple frames. So then we can decode that natural image from a summed spike measure. Basically, we sum the spikes that occur during those repeated frames and use that response to decode that image. So we're abandoning the movies. So we used simple approximations to transfer the full spatiotemporal model I showed on the last slide to just a simple static encoding model. So this is the kind of overview of that encoding model. So the top row is the spatial filter. So these models consist of a spatial filter followed by a nonlinearity, followed by Poisson spike draws. So we show this um, spatial filter for each of the four cell types, and then the nonlinearity is shown on the second row. And then the third row shows the mosaics for each cell type. So basically in the retina, each cell type tiles visual space pretty completely. So we replicate that in our simulations. And these contours just show approximately where the spatial filters of the different simulated cells are. And then the bottom row gives a sense of how much information is contained in the neural responses. So here I'm plotting the summed spike measure in response to the image on the left. Uh, in the receptive field of the cell, so where, the, where its spatial filter is. And you can see that there's quite a bit of information contained about the image. So now that we have our encoding model, we simulate responses to all of ImageNet, and then use that to train our linear decoder and our deep neural network. So specifically, I'm mostly going to be talking about results using a convolutional autoencoder. So um, I think all of you know convolutional neural networks consist of layers, and at each layer, a, there's a set of filters that operates over the whole image. And autoencoders basically compress representation and then expand it back out. And then I'll also touch on some results that we got using generative adversarial networks. So these show the basic results. Um, the top row is the original images that we trained on. The middle row is the linear decoded reconstructions, and the bottom row is the autoencoder decoded images. So you can see that the linear decoded images are pretty good, and we'd expect that given how much information was in those neural images. But the autoencoder does enhance and denoise these images. And that perceptual observation is borne out by a couple metrics we examined. So on the left, I'm showing mean, just pixel-wise mean squared error, which is the loss function we trained on. And almost every, this is showing a thousand images, and almost every image is better for the autoencoder. And then on the right, I'm showing a structural similarity index. So it gives a better measure of perceptual similarity. And again, even though we didn't train on this, almost every image is better using the autoencoder. So now we have that basic result that the autoencoder helps. Um, so we tried to explore why the autoencoder is helping, especially looping back to this idea that maybe it's implicitly learning the statistics of the natural images, uh, specifically the phase structure of the natural images. So we created phase scrambled images. And to do, make these, you basically take the phases of the Fourier transform of the original image and randomly replace them. So you can see that they don't have this kind of long range structure that's present in the original images. So then we trained a linear decoder and an autoencoder just on those phase scrambled images, and then we tested it on the original images. So when we look at the linear decoder, we see that, so the subscript here indicates what data set it was trained on. So the linear decoder trained on the phase scrambled images does basically as well as the linear decoder trained on ImageNet. And you can see that these two example images are pretty identical. So this shows that the phase structure wasn't important in the linear decoder training and performance. But that isn't true for the autoencoder. Uh, you see on this bottom plot here that the autoencoder trained on phase scrambled images doesn't generalize well to the original images. It does a lot worse than an autoencoder trained on those images. And again, you can see the differences in the example images. So this is at least consistent with the idea that maybe phase structure of natural images is helping that autoencoder improvement. So 
all those results were using the convolutional autoencoder. We also tried out generative adversarial networks. Um, so Jan gave a really de good description of these earlier, but just to briefly recap, uh, these co models consist of training a generator and a discriminator at the same time. And in our case, the generator goes from the linear decoded image and enhances it to the neural network enhanced image. And then the discriminator tries to decide whether it's a real image or a neural network enhanced image. So we did see some perceptual improvements using this on general ImageNet, but we really saw a lot of improvement using these GANs on a specific category of human faces. So we used the Celeb A data set. And so all of these models I'm showing here were trained just on the faces. And you can see that the GAN, which is on the far right, really results in pretty real, like impressively realistic looking images. Um, and especially compared to the autoencoder, they are less overly smoothed and they've got some more realistic like texture. So overall, we, we've shown that the autoencoder improves on the linear decoder and we get more improvements with the GAN. Um, and in general, our approach avoids an explicit natural image prior, which has um, proposed a real problem for similar efforts before, and it circumvents the need for a ton of training data by using this encoding model to simulate data. So um, in the, there's a lot of future work to do with this. So the main track we're looking at right now is showing this works in real data. So we just recently collected some experimental data showing um, pulse movies to this retinal prep. So we should be able to analyze our, our approach in that. And so far, we see some preliminary results that seem promising and seem to indicate that this might actually work. <laughs> uh, we also want to play around with perceptual loss functions. So mean squared error is an imperfect measure because it does lead to these overly smoothed images. And especially for something like evaluating retinal prosthetics, we really want the images to be perceptually similar. We also want to move to better encoding models. So the linear and nonlinear Poisson models that I showed are pretty standard in the field, but we actually had recent work showing that recurrent neural networks led to bigger improvements. So our decoder is obviously fairly closely tied to the quality of the encoder, so we would hope to get even more gains using a more accurate model. And then finally, we want to deco decode colored images and then move to decoding the full movies instead of these static images. So thanks for listening. <laughs> And I'll take any questions. <laughs> so we have time for two questions. But when you, uh, you evaluate your performance, how do you know in the end if it was a limit of your encoding model or your decoding model? Maybe, if, maybe you would have done better with a better decoder, or maybe you're actually hitting the limits of your encoding model. How do you ever know? Yeah, I don't think in this approach where we use both, there's necessarily an easy way to tease it apart. I guess it depends on what metric you're examining. We were only really concerned with the quality of, examining the quality of the decoder. So, you know, given one encoding model, we can obviously test different decoders and see which improves. Um, but in the general approach we have, yeah, they would work together and the decoder would be very closely linked to the encoding model. But you can, you can see kind of by also looking at real data as well, because there you're not using an encoding model, and you can explore just the decoder on those activities. One last question. Okay, going, going. Gone. Okay. Oh, I <laughs> yeah, think. There, oh, there was you. one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Henry. If you notice anything systematic in the way that the decoder failed or, or did better or worse, I mean, you can visually appreciate that it's quite easy very easily, but did you imagine, or did you look at uh, error in frequency space or orientation space? Um, we did a little, but not systematically, but I mean, the main problem with our decoded images is fairly obvious, and that's that we're using mean squared error as our loss function, so that, <laughs> sorry, so the main um, problem with these images is that they're, they're overly blurred. Um, like you saw, especially in the faces for the autoencoder. Besides that, it does have, you know, the, I think the normal troubles of edges and small details like that, and some texture, especially when using mean spreader. So. Yeah.